computer interface, signal processing, and embedded systems. There are more than five researchers that were carried out under the supervision of Dr. Angela De Silva at the University of Morotua alone. He has been invited to perform several talks from various places since 2015. He has spoken on the topic dry electrodes in non-invasive electrophysiology at the International Workshop on Nano Device Technology held at Hiroshima University Research Institute for Nano Device and Biosystems on March 2018 in Japan. Dr. Angela De Silva is currently a member of IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society since 2015 and IEEE Systems Man and Cybernetics Society since 2017. I now cordially invite Dr. Angela De Silva to commence the session. Thank you very much for the uh, elaborated introduction. Uh, Yes, so good morning everybody. Uh, so we are now in this technical session two, parallel session two, which is uh, uh, related to uh, biomedical engineering. And uh, there are three very interesting uh, presentations uh, uh, to be presented now. Uh, and I will uh, cordially invite the three uh, the speakers uh, and all the authors of these papers, um, uh, Ms. Varsha Jayavardhana, Ms. Indu uh, Harsha, and Ms. Situmini Pereira to the, uh, the podium. Yes, so without uh, any delay, um, we'll start off the, the first uh, presentation. The title of it is uh, Predicting the Freezing of Gait in Parkinson's Patients Based on Machine Learning and Variable Sensors, a review. Uh, so this paper will be presented by Ms. Varsha Anarkali Jayavardhana. Uh, Ms. Varsha Jayawardhana is currently a final year biomedical engineering un undergraduate at the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Telecommunications Engineering at the, at the Faculty of Engineering uh, General Sir uh, John Kotalawala Defense University. Uh, her final year research is based on the prediction of freezing of gait in Parkinson's patients using wearable sensors and machine learning. Her research interests uh, lie in the areas of uh, neural engineering and prosthesis. And she has presented her previous research at the KDU uh, IRC 2021. And uh, her third research publication will be presented here today uh, at the KDU IRC 2022. A very good morning to all the reputed guests, lecturers, and my dear colleagues. I'm Varsha Jayavardhana, and today I will be presenting my review on predicting the freezing of gait in Parkinson's patients based on machine learning and variable sensors. This paper is co-authored by Dr. PPCR Karuna Sekara, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Telecommunication Engineering of KDU, and Dr. Y.V. N.D. Sirisena, a consultant neurologist at the Ragami Teaching Hospital. So, if we talk about freezing of gait, it's a very common and disabling complication in Parkinson's patients that will temporarily hinder the forward progression of the normal gait and it will prevent them from reinitiating their normal gait. So, this is very common in late stage and middle stage Parkinson's patients and the prevalence rate is around 20 to 80%. So this is a very disabling condition and it can result in potentially damaging falls for the patient because the patient tries to move but the patient freezes in position and due to the momentum of the upper body, the patient will topple and fall over. Apart from that, there is a characteristic change in their gait patterns and they make shuffling steps and their step length will also be reduced. And uh, they can also have further complications like osteoporosis and constipation because of their lack of mobility. 
So the patients will be reluctant to move when they experience this freezing of gait condition. So they have to be constantly assisted by someone else. So they will actually lose their sense of independence and they will experience social isolation and depression as well. So there's actually no cure for F4G, which highlights the importance of a need for this uh, solution for F4G. So there are uh, systems which can actually detect F4G condition, and this will allow reinitiation of their normal gait, and these systems will detect their abnormal gait. So once the event is detected, the patient can overcome this event by performing several activities like humming using metronomes or by making high steps in a single position. So apart from this, uh, we have uh, current clinical methods of detection including video cameras where the clinicians can actually record the patient's motion and they can do an offline analysis later. But this is not very beneficial to the patient because we cannot do an online processing and the patient cannot be monitored continuously. So there are many researchers performed in this area and most of them are sensor-based systems which de detect these FOG events. So these will use EMG sensors, EEG sensors, skin conductance sensors, pressure sensors, and inertial measurement units. So these are high, highly beneficial since they can monitor the patients continuously, and they can be comfortably be worn over the patient's body, and these are also very easy to set up. So in the gate of these Parkinson's patients, before they reach this FOG event, they have a, a characteristic change in their gait before the event occurs. So if we can detect this event during this window, which is known as a pre-FOG window, the freezing of gate event can actually be predicted before the event occurs. So these prediction systems are actually better than detection systems because they have a method of, like they can detect this method earlier and this will allow the patient to react before this event happens. Also, detection systems are not very useful because a patient can actually detect the event by themselves when the event occurs when they are off their medication. So this prediction system is actually used to address the latency issues associated with the current detection systems. And these patient uh, prediction systems can notify the patient well ahead of this event. So the aim of my review is to explore and analyze the existing methods of predicting freezing of gait that will use variable sensor hardware systems and machine learning algorithms. So if you talk about the methodology of my review, I used a systematic approach to conduct my literature review. So initially, I identified the scope of this research, which was uh, existing predictive technologies based on engineering approaches for this freezing of gait. And I studied the area of interest by uh, uh, exploring peer review documents and scientific articles from databases like Google Scholar and PubMed. And the search results were refined, and the titles of these uh, papers and the abstracts uh, were searched. So once the literature was identified, I isolated the literature that actually had only variable sensors and machine learning. And these were further refined based on several parameters, like the activities that they performed, the age ranges of the patients, the types of sensors used, the numbers of the sensors used, and the sensor locations as well. So using this data, I compiled my literature review. So talking about the results of my literature review, so first I'm going to talk about the sensor types and the common sensor placements that were, uh, that were actually used. So if you talk about inertial measurement units, they have accelerometers and gyroscopes, which will measure the acceleration and the angular motion of the patient. So they're commonly placed on the shin, shank, thigh, the lower back, ankles, above the knee and the hip. And the accuracy of, of these uh, systems use, using IMUs have reported 85%, 85.5%. So if you talk about uh, systems based on pressure sensors, they are actually used to detect pressure, and they are commonly located as an insole be, uh, beneath the foot of the patient, and the, accuracy, the reported accuracy is 92%. So there are some less common sensors like force plates, which can measure the ground reaction force, and this didn't have a reported accuracy. And EEG electrodes uh, placed as a cap on the patient's head, which can measure the electrical activity of the brain and ECG electrodes, which can measure the electrical activity of the heart, commonly located on the chest of the patients. And even skin conductance sensors were minorly used in the index and the middle fingers and the wrist of the patients. 
So if you talk about the features that were extracted, so features are actually measurable quantitative data that uh, is extracted from raw data of the patients. So we have commonly encountered time domain features and frequency domain features. So the time domain features that were commonly reported were the mean standard deviation, angular velocity, angular jerk, and the foot velocity. And if you talk about the frequency domain data, they were derived using Fourier transform and wavelet transform. So some features derived from Fourier transform were spectral, uh, spectral density and the power of the signal. And from wavelet transform, uh, approximation coefficients and detail coefficients were used. So some commonly used algorithms were implemented through supervised, semi-supervised, and non-supervised pattern classification. So supervised uh, pattern classification basically uses label data, which will actually divide uh, the patient into training, training and testing groups, and the training group is labeled, and the testing group is unlabeled. So unsupervised pattern classification yields better results than supervised pattern classification for this FOG prediction. And uh, this will basically use unlabeled data, and this will eliminate the subjective biases uh, of labeling, actually. And if you talk about semi-supervised pattern classification, this will use advantages of both supervised and non-supervised pattern classification. And this will actually eliminate the need for these uh, labor-intensive uh, labeling pro processes. And this actually has a highest reported sensitivity and specificity of 95.9% and 95.6%. So if we talk about the types of algorithms that were commonly used, we have neural networks, decision trees, and support vector machines. So neural networks, actually, they identify spatial patterns in the data. And for this, you don't need feature extraction, which is a major advantage. And uh, they actually develop images based on the data that they have. So one common disadvantage is the complexity of these algorithms that were developed. And they took a lot of time to implement. So the sensitivities and the specificities reported were 98.8% and 95.1%. So decision trees actually uh, use principles of binary classification. And one advantage of this is uh, it prevented overfitting of the uh, data. So these have reported sensitivities of 83.8% and 82.1%. If you talk about support vector machines, they actually construct a hyperplane and classify the data based on the proximity of the data to the hyperplane. So this has reported accuracies of 89.2%. OK, so discussing about the results of my research, I will first talk about the sensor types that I observed. So it was reported that multimodal sensors reported a higher accuracy because they combine different sensors, and they have the advantage of different sensors rather than using one sensor. So uh, we have patient-specific differences because FOG doesn't manifest the same way for each patient. So these patients' differences can be easily identified if you use different types of sensors. And uh, the most accurate sensor that was reported was the pressure sensors, and these were comfortable and convenient to wear, and they were less intrusive to the patient as well. So if you talk about IMUs, they were the uh, most widely used sensors because they were more lightweight and more compact, and they could be easily accessed and worn over the patient's body. So if we pair these IMUs and pressure sensors, we could get systems that could actually have a better result than using IMUs and pressure sensors individually. And the other types of sensors like force plates, EEG electrodes, ECG electrodes, and skin conductance sensors, they were not actually widely used. So talking about the sensor placements, in the IMUs, the most common sensor location was the shank, and that has the highest reported uh, accuracies of 95 to 96.7%, and this has the lowest patient dependency on the data. So if we wear the sensors on a distal location like the hip or the waist, that is not going to yield accurate results because that's distal to the location of the FOG uh, event occurring. And uh, if you talk about uh, pressure sensors, most of, most of them were worn as an insole under the foot. And uh, the common sensor locations that were observed were the metatarsal, metatarsal calcaneus and the phalanges, which yielded sensitivities of 96% and specificities of 99.6%. So talking about the commonly used features, actually frequency domain features, they actually allow mapping of minor changes of the gait patterns and the uh, minor changes between the uh, minor changes in the pre-FOG windows, and time domain features allow uh, distinct differences to be observed between the gate patterns of individual patients. And if we use time domain features and frequency domain features, basically if we use a time frequency domain uh, data, 
then we can combine the advantages of both of these. So if you talk about the algorithms, the most commonly used algorithms and the uh, algorithm that yielded the highest accuracy was the conv convolutional neural networks. And then we had uh, adaptive boost in decision trees and support vector machines and random forests. So if you use supervised pattern classification models, we have a degree of personalization for each of these patients as well. So even though we need subject-specific models, there's limited data to develop all these subject-specific models. So currently, uh, generalized models are the ones that are being used. And talking about the limitations of these systems, these systems are basically offline, so none of them do online processing. And if we don't have real-time analysis, we can't provide feedback to the patient at the moment. So the patient would have fallen over by the uh, time that the event is detected or predicted. So patients also have specific differences in their bodies, so using generalized models would not be very ideal for these patients because there's a risk of incorrect classification and uh, incorrect validations for these models as well. So if I talk about the future works of my research, I'm planning to develop a real-time F4G prediction system using IMUs and pressure sensor data, and by using machine learning algorithms which are based on uh, semi-supervised pattern classification. In conclusion, uh, I have identified that the best sensors were plant pressure sensors and IMU sensors combined together, and the optimal sensor placement for the IMU was a shank, and for the plant pressure sensors, it was a calcaneus, metatarsals, and the phalanges. Talk about the algorithms that were the best. Uh, convolutional neural networks have the highest reported accuracy. And for fish extraction, if you use time and frequency domain features combined together, they would give a better result. So these are the references that I used for my presentation and for my review as well. And uh, I would like to thank all the lecturers of the Department of Electrical, Electronic, and Telecommunication Engineering for their valuable feedback and guidance, and Mr. IMP Le Perima for the support extended. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, we will uh, uh, take the questions individually for uh, these papers, probably, so you can stay there uh, to, to answer the questions. Um, so um, the floor is open for questions, and also I think there are online uh, participants. Uh, you can also uh, ask questions now. It's a sensor networks actually. So if it's like an IMU, one IMU is placed on uh, each leg. And if it's like pressure sensors, we use multiple pressure sensors because we are measuring the point pressure. So the pressure variation can be mapped uh, accurately while walking because the pressure varies from point to point while we are walking. So we use uh, multiple pressure sensors for the foot and basically we use like one IMU per each leg. That means, uh, is it power battery powered, or is there any any harvest in self powered mode? Or uh, the current systems, sir, yeah. uh, they actually all they are research based, so most of them are actually battery powered. So, in your proposal, in in this uh, gap, ha have you identified that type of uh, thing we have been required for this type of application? Uh, the thing is, like, we have to have a system with a long battery life because we can't constantly replace all the batteries. So if I'm designing a, a system, I would have to uh, address that issue as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and your research work. And uh, basically, I would like to know that uh, did you basically implemented this device or is still at, that uh, is under process? So this is uh, what I did today was a review for my final year research. So I am in the process of developing my device for this, based on this. Okay, okay. Then uh, that uh, I thought that you have already implemented this and okay, okay. That uh, I understood that. And uh, that uh, you have indicated that the best algorithm for this one, this CNN or yes, any other, the, that is the best one, no? 
Uh, yes, sir. Convolutional neural networks reported the highest accuracy for prediction, sir. Okay, I think uh, once uh, you have progress to implement the, this device, maybe uh, this is related to this uh, wearable electronics, you will have to get the ethical clearance or something like uh, that, as which will be uh, faced in the future works. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm indicating this, uh, some sort of a neural network or something like that. So in this uh, review, have you find that uh, what type of uh, amount of computational power you required? Uh, the thing is, sir, like uh, for most of the researchers that used convolutional neural networks, they were very complex to be designed. Uh, so right now, I'm, I won't be implementing convolutional neural networks because of uh, the computational time and the complexity of this computation. So then, uh, what you identified, I mean, uh, in your system, what you suggest to do, in, you are planning to do? I will be implementing uh, something like support vector machines, sir, because that is also very accurate and less complex than the convolutional neural networks. Okay, okay thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any other uh, questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, review that you have done. Thank you, um, sir. And um, I was actually a bit uh, uh, curious about this uh, the usage of EEG uh, results. I think finally you said uh, they were not widely used. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so don't you think, like, uh, even though this uh, freezing of gate is like we can visually see and it's, it's more. Um, uh, pronounced in terms of uh, limbs or motor movements, the initiation of the, the, the action or the thought is coming up from the brain. So if you tap the EEG, uh, would you be able to get an early, early, very early prediction compared to assessing the, the actual movement? Yes, sir. actually, uh, these are all based on neurotransmitters, so like it's an imbalance of neurotransmitters. That's the cause of Parkinson's as well. So if we use a system which can actually use EEG, that would, uh, I, give, we'll be able to give earlier predictions for freezing of gait rather than using sensors which, which are actually located uh, in the lower extremities of the body. So I think that would uh, give, a better give an advantage for the patient as well. But, but the EEG results were low, right? Yeah, uh, the, the they are not widely used, sir. Widely used. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. But I think uh, yeah, that could also be uh, looked into. I think f f some of the challenges would be to uh, remove the noise because it's anyway a moving, moving subject. So, yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, the other sort of uh, question uh, uh, is that um, when you're going to uh, do this work, uh, are you planning to do it on patients or just to collect it from normal? Uh, I plan to collect patient data, sir. So, like, I am in the process of getting uh, ethical approval from the Ethical Review Committee right. of KDU. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Next uh, presentation is on uh, local binary pattern based feature features for prostate cancer detection. So. Uh, this will be presented by Ms. K. A. Induharsha. Uh, Ms. Induharsha is a product of uh, General uh, John Kotalawal Defense University, expecting to graduate in uh, 2022. Uh, she holds a BSc in Biomedical Engineering with first class from the General Sir John Kotalawal Defense University. Uh, she has been an active learner and contributor in other departments activities during her academic years. Uh, Ms. Harsha held the position of Vice Secretary and President of the Biomedical Engineering Society during the uh, four years of her bachelor's degree. She is currently reading an MSc uh, in Biomedical Engineering from General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. Ms. Harsha completed her internship in Technomedics International Private Limited, uh, excelling in the role as an emerging biomedical engineer. Currently, she's uh, a project coordinator at Lions Restoration based in Melbourne, Australia. So you can present.
Good morning to all the reputed guests. Uh, I'm Indu Harsha. Uh, today I will be presenting uh, my study on local binary pattern based features, co authored by my supervisors, uh, Mr. Mudida Bandara and uh, Mr. Dulit Hevadikara. So, to start off with, uh, I would like to provide a brief introduction to my study. So prostate cancer is known to be one of the most uh, prevalent cancers in males, having a, a greater mortality rate than their estimated incidence. Prostate cancer differs from most other cancers because it is usually multifocal and uh, does not appear as a single spherical mass. Also, the illness progresses at different rates uh, and is frequently asymptomatic until it has reached the last stages. So uh, one of the most frequently used prostate cancer tests is the prostate-specific uh, antigen test. But even though this is being widely used, uh, clinicians still prefer to use imaging modalities along with uh, guided biopsy. So uh, as a result, there has been a growing appreciation for bu uh, future benefits of using imaging techniques uh, to guide biopsy, allowing for improved detection of larger tumors. Out of all the uh, imaging modalities, multiparametric uh, magnetic resonance imaging has managed to emerge as the most effective. Compared to uh, serum PSA screening test, MPMRI uh, combined with image-guided biopsy has better assessed factors such as uh, size, location, and uh, staging of discrete lesions inside the prostate. To perform uh, image processing, texture is one of the uh, fundamental features that we analyze. So in the realm of uh, Pattern recognition and classification, texture analysis is crucial. So local binary pattern has already uh, been widely explored and implemented in numerous uh, areas due to several reasons such as fast computation, easy implementation, and uh, excellent efficiency. The importance of using local binary pattern is that uh, it is continuously examining the surrounding uh, pixel areas called the neighborhood. So even though imaging has played an essential role in prostate cancer staging, the clear justifications for imaging techniques, their sensitivity and uh, specificity are still debatable. The accuracy of detection uh, using imaging techniques should be improved to ensure the early detection of prostate cancer. Therefore, the primary aim of uh, my study was to identify LBP-based features to uh, diagnose prostate cancer at a faster rate. Now, uh, I would like to discuss the uh, methodology followed in the study. The first step uh, of algorithm implementation was to select an appropriate image data set. Prostate X uh, image collection uh, of the cancer image in archive is a collection of uh, MRI studies performed on the prostate. This collection contains T2-weighted, uh, dynamic contrast enhanced, diffusion-weighted, and uh, proton density-weighted uh, images. There, there was a total of 165 subsequent studies with prostate cancer and 183 patients without prostate cancer for a total of 348 trials of 347 individuals. The uh, images were first, uh, they were categorized to training and test data. And uh, for my study, I used the T2-weighted images from the transversal plane and after all the selection, uh, selection process, 76 false and uh, 33 true patient data were finalized. 
The first image uh, shown here is of a false patient and the second patient uh, image is of a true patient. To uh, compute the first order and second order statistics, the algorithm was built using a MATLAB platform with an experimental environment of Windows 11 system. The flowchart gives an overview of the algorithm developed. And algorithm one was used to calculate the first order statistics and uh, algorithm two for calculating the second order statistics. The second step was to use manual ROI uh, selection to mask out the prostate gland. An inbuilt function was used to construct the mask as a binary image by setting the pixels inside the ROI to one and uh, pixels outside to three, uh, zero. The next step was to create the LBP image out of the chosen ROI. Uh, for this, a MATLAB script was uh, written to implement the generation of the LVP image. So the first image here shows the uh, manual ROI selection performed on the prostate gland. And then uh, the second image of the selected ROI. And the third image is for the uh, LVP image generated out of the ROI. After choosing the ROIs, uh, the, they were subjected to the two algorithms. The first algorithm was to generate the histogram of the LBP image. From it, uh, four first order statistics were calculated, mean, skewness, standard deviation, and kurtosis. The second algorithm was to generate the uh, gray level run length matrix. Here, I uh, actually used a user-defined uh, function named GLRLM, which was constructed uh, with reference to a pre-programmed uh, script. Here, I uh, calculated seven features, long-run emphasis, short-run emphasis, gray-level non-uniformity, uh, run-length non-uniformity, run percentage, low gray-level run emphasis, high gray-level run emphasis. So in the field of research, always someone, everybody is interested in uh, deriving conclusions about a population, but it is yet impractical. So I, uh, I performed two sample t-tests the, as the hypothesis testing to confirm if the mean uh, between the two uh, populations is different. So the test was con uh, conducted at 5% confidence level, and um, MATLAB script was programmed to return the variable of uh, accepted or uh, rejected null hypothesis. So uh, the algorithm calculates four first order and seven second order statistics. And uh, first of all, I plotted the uh, results of the features as a bar plot just to uh, visually observe if there was uh, any clear difference, if I can observe in the features. So in the first bar plot, it shows that uh, standard deviation and kurtosis have a visible difference in their height of the bars, which indicated a better chance of classifying benign and malignant uh, tumors than mean and skewness. Then the same was done on the second order uh, features. They are uh, actually RLN, run length non-uniformity, uh, showed the most uh, better probability of uh, using it as the feature for classifying benign and malignant tumors. Next, uh, by carrying out the two sample t-test, the aim was to confirm which of the features can be used to categorize patients as healthy and uh, cancerous. The features mean and skewness gave a result of zero, indicating the acceptance of null hypothesis. This result concludes that there is no uh, significant difference in the two populations at a 5% confidence level. On the other hand, the features standard deviation and kurtosis 
uh, produced a result of one indicating the rejection of null hypothesis. So this uh, concludes that these two features can be used as two features to identify benign and malignant tumors. Then as for the second order characteristics, only one uh, positive result, that is run length non-uniformity, uh, showed the rejection of uh, null hypothesis, uh, indicating it can be used for uh, classification. The use of uh, multiparametric uh, MRI for prostate cancer staging and detection is well known. Uh, depending on the clinically critical condition uh, criteria and the MPMRI threshold use, the accuracy in identifying clinically significant prostate cancer varies. So this study aimed to determine first order and second order uh, texture features that can be used to uh, identify prostate cancer. Out of the 11 features, uh, the study identified three positive features standard deviation, kurtosis, and run length non-uniformity. Uh, although the outcome of this prostate cancer detection method is positive, there is still uh, potential for de uh, development in the future. These are uh, some of the references used in my study. First and uh, foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to my supervisor, Mr. Dulita Hevadikaram, and co-supervisor, Mr. Mudita Bandara, for their uh, assistance in developing the research objectives and guidance provided. Uh, then I would also like to thank the Cancer Imaging Archive for making the Prostate uh, X Challenge Image Collection available for the public. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the interesting presentation. Uh, yes, so uh, the floor is open uh, for questions. And also online uh, uh, listeners also can ask questions. Thank you very, very much for your, uh, this valuable presentation. And then uh, do you have any plan to improve the number of uh, samples that you are Getting because uh, once you get it, so then sometimes your this uh, statistical data may be vary. So sometimes you may be in with some sort of a very, uh, I mean, different uh, conclusion. What you have now. So do do you have any plan for that? Um, actually, uh, we, uh, I have suggested of carrying out a clinical, um, like clinically uh, conducting the research because. I actually used the uh, image collection from uh, Cancer Imaging Archive. Uh, with the COVID pandemic, it was very difficult to access the hospitals. So it was one of the suggestions to carry out a clinical uh, experimentation with a large sample. So then in that case, you are planning to go with the same statistical technique? Go uh, there were like uh, other methods used in the literature review, uh, so I am planning to do one of those uh, suggestions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Is the the noisy practical images? And so, how do you uh, address this problem? Uh, how do you plan to address this problem? Uh, actually, and uh, at the same time, can you please explain how you are going to validate uh, this me uh, the methodology you have proposed? Uh, actually, uh, as for the noises, so I will have to uh, go with the noise reduction methods that uh, actually in image processing, more uh, pre-processing is required. So that will have to be addressed. And... Uh, yeah, this, uh, what was this? <laughs> so, uh, that actually, uh, there are several techniques. So, I'll have to conduct a more in deep uh, uh, review on that. Thank you, Thank you sir.
good presentation. So I would like to ask, since there's a statistical analysis part, uh, like, uh, have you uh, considered or give a try to compare your, because it's a, completely, I have seen a lot of graphs and things, to uh, compare with the past uh, some literature data? So whether you are getting same kind of trend, actually, as the insert mentioned, to validating in the, did you give an attempt or any plans? Maybe no, I actually the, had a very t problem with the la time. Time. Uh, because of that, I couldn't actually uh, validate the process. So uh, the initial idea was to go on with the uh, validation process and train classifiers. But with the time, I had to uh, limit my uh, scope. Yeah, so when you are getting the results, like the data, so uh, did you like got any chance to talk to the patients, like, uh, and uh, no, not no, that no. kind of, yeah, maybe That's extension, right? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think at KDU, at the hospital, you have all the facility. We have a good oncology uh, department with oncologists and uh, oncology surgeons. Then we have a good urologist uh, who does uh, a similar activity. I'm sure, I think, especially the academia must uh, ensure that when they, somebody is doing a research on these kind of subjects, uh, they should be uh, directed to meet them. And uh, most of these uh, details would have been obtained from the hospital itself uh, because we too do the same scanning uh, at the hospital. So you don't have to uh, go for archives to find uh, details. Now you can get these details uh, physically from the hospital itself. So I think as somebody said, uh, did you check with the patients also? I mean, all these facilities are there. Of course, if you are dealing with the patients, you have to get the ethical review uh, committee approval. Uh, then uh, you can. So I suggest in the future, Dean and HODs, uh, to ensure that especially biomedical uh, students, uh, they should work uh, hand in hand with the clinicians, the surgeons together. Then uh, your outcomes will be much better and they too can guide you better. This is only the engineering part, no? But uh, medicine, uh, this thing also, you can, uh, in fact, validate also at times certain things, uh, what you do. So I think, Dean, we have to do that. Otherwise, uh, sometimes these students may not be aware that we have the facility even at KDU. Were you aware that uh, we have all this? No, COVID time you were operating. Other hospitals were closed. But KDU hospital was fully functional. So that's why you may, I think uh, in the in future we have to uh, ensure that uh, we should coordinate them uh, properly. Because as undergraduates they may not know the facilities we have and how it could be done and they may not be able to reach them. So we had to do that. And medical faculty is on the other side of this building. It's not very far away, it's only 25 meters away. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, any other? Uh, yeah. Uh, Yes, a small comment from me. I think, uh, as the uh, vice chancellor and uh, others mentioned, there's a lot of uh, potential in in expanding this uh, this study. I think this is a good base that you have uh, uh, and, and the supervisors uh, have, have started on. Uh, there's a lot of potential uh, so that you can expand it. Um, related to results, uh, uh, you have uh, given these uh, t-test results. But apart from that, uh, did you check um, like the accuracies um, 
uh, sensitivity, specificity, that sort of uh, no, sir. parameters? No, uh, sir. It was initially planned to like uh, test the validation and uh, to train uh, classifiers. But with the time uh, constraint, it was very difficult to perform mm -hmm. that uh, uh, scope wise well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, roughly, like, out of how many positive images did you get? Uh, like, true uh, positives? 33 images were used. Yeah, so out of those? 76 false images and 33 uh, true images. Right. True patients. So all the all the true patients were identified as true. Yes. Right. With this particular parameter. Yeah. Right. False positive. Uh, it was not uh, that much. Only a few. Yeah. If if you include at least those uh, sort of studies uh, results that would have been. It was. Uh, but if I compare, it was more uh, biased toward the, towards the false, uh, false uh, patients because uh, the number of uh, false patients were more, the images. Hmm. So there was kind of a, a misclassification as well. That's why I was uh, suggesting for a larger group of uh, patients with a real uh, experimentation, right. clinical. Right. Yes. So, good luck with the rest of the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, so, the next uh, presentation is on uh, methods of measuring CSF pressure. Yeah. Now, RSP, VSV, USP, NDC, PSC, MPhil, the Vice Chancellor of General Sir John, De John Kotalawala Defence University, along with Engineer S.U. Dampage, the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, to present a token of appreciation to the session chair, Dr. Angela De Silva. Thank you, sir. Uh, methods of measuring CSF pressure, a review. Uh, this will be presented by Ms. H. Uh, Situmini Hansika Pereira. Ms. Uh, Situmini Hansika Pereira is a final year biomedical engineering undergraduate of the Department of Electrical, Electronic, and Telecommunication Engineering. Uh, Faculty of Engineering, General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. The paper titled Methods of Measuring CSF Pressure is her third publication as an undergraduate, where she published her first research paper titled Advancements of Electronic Stethoscope Review in 14th International Research Conference last year. Her second publication titled A Rechargeable Pulse Oximeter for Remote Monitoring of Multiple Patients was published this year in Volume 2, Issue 1 of the KDU Journal for Multidisciplinary Studies. Her interests include medical instrumentation, radiology, tissue engineering, and biotechnology. So, uh, uh, Ms. Sithmini Pera, uh, you can present. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my research title is Methods of Measuring Cerebrospinal Fluid Pressure, which is a review. And this paper is co-authored co by E. A. D. Hevadikaram, the senior lecturer of our department. And moving on with the outline, first I'm going to talk about a bit about the introduction about the CSF, pressure, uh, CSF and the CSF pressure, along with AIM, and majorly the literature review of my paper. And finally, the discussions, conclusions, along with references. So basically, this uh, cerebrospinal fluid is a colorless fluid, just like the water, and that surrounds and baths the brain and spinal cord, protecting the central nervous system. It actually plays a major role in the central nervous system, including the brain. As you can see, uh, the CSF is indicated in blue color in the image, 
and uh, it gives a mechanical and immunological protection to the central nervous system. Also, it acts as a buffer in the system and the CSF plays an important parameter to keep the homeostasis of the body. For a healthy individual, around uh, 125 to 150 of CSF volume is present at a body at a time. So we are like 25 milliliters in brain ventricles and 125 in subarachnoid spaces. So the CSF pressure, uh, CSF has a very dynamic pressure caused by due to secretion, absorption, and circulation and its resistance to flow. Because this secretion is mainly done by croid flexors in brain, where it contributes to around 60 to 70 percent of the total uh, secretion of the CSF volume. So the CSF secretion is around 400 to 600 milliliters per day for a healthy individual, and it, it, it renewed about four to five times per day. So like the abnormalities and health issues can lead to different uh, evaluated CSF pressure, high CSF pressure, and this can be caused by different uh, complications and abnormalities in central nervous system. So like for an example, during brain injuries, brain tumors, uh, and abnormal buildup of CSF bleedings, and swelling in the brain, high blood pressure, and meningitis, and different infections. So like this is one of the very important parameter where the doctors get the readings of the CSF pressure of patients to uh, identify what is the issue, so if there's an indication for higher pre elevated pressure, CSF pressure. So this uh, highly elevated, sorry, elevated CSF pressure can lead to different complications, like including uh, strokes, seizures, neurological damage, and even in death. So my aim of the re uh, literature review is to evaluate the different methods that are used to measure the CSF pressure. So i uh, start off with my literature review. Uh, there are basically two methods of measuring CSF pressure, two invasive methods where you can, uh, doctors insert a needle into subarachnoid space in spine, where, you, where we measure the lumbar puncture pressure during lumbar puncture procedure, and uh, also by inserting a needle into ventricle of the brain, where the intracranial pressure, the, which is also known as ICP, which, measures the, di, which, which directly measures the pressure inside of the brain. So, so first I'm going to talk about the intracranial pressure. So as you can see in the picture, there are implanted sensors, and in the uh, A is a wireless method where the biocompatible and implantable telemet uh, telemetric ICP sensor is used into the ventricles and uh, with wireless communication between sensor and the external receiver. So that's, that's a wireless method, and the BCD is a wire-based method where in the B, uh, the ventricle, ventricular catheter is placed within the cerebral ventricle, and D is a dedicated ICP center, sensor implanted within the brain parenchyma, and D is the ICP sensor placed within epidural location. So all these BCD are wired connected with an external receiver. So the methods used for ICP, uh, widely, uh, the, these implantable ICP sensors are used. Where for an example, the five optic cam uh, ICP sensors, which enables multimodality neuromodeling, where you can monitor several psychological, uh, physiological variables, including CBF, brain oxygenation, and metabolism. And the strain gauge Cotman microsensors, it also uh, includes a diffuse piezoelectric strain gauge in the transducer to measure ICP and the pneumatic sensors. In pneumatic sensors, uh, at the distal end of the probe, there's a balloon to measure the uh, surrounding uh, pressure of the surrounding tissue in the brain. So the second one is the ventricular catheters. There are mainly two types of catheters, intraventricular and interparachymular catheters. And finally, finally, the pulsatile ICV monitoring, which is a very expensive one and not performed in most of the countries. So uh, during this pulsatile ICV monitoring, it studies and analyzes the ICP pressure changes occur during each cardiac cycle, and the resultant output is uh, obtained as a wave or a pulse in ICP pressure graph. So actually, uh, what are, uh, these uh, ICP methods of measuring this ICP, it's a very highly accurate method, and uh, we can measure the ICP directly uh, using implantable sensors in real time, but there's a very high cost for this method. And there's a very high limit of risk for the patient because this uh, directly insert a sensor into the brain 
by uh, putting a needle. So there's a very high risk for infection, and this, this is performed only in limited healthcare facilities because for like pulse cell ICP monitoring, they, these methods are very performed in only a few countries as well. So it creates a very high cost and the availability is very low, especially in countries like us. So the second one is lumbar puncture pressure. Uh, actually, this lumbar puncture is a less invasive method performed using minimal equipment to extract CSF volume from lower spine. So during this lumbar puncture pressure, the CSF pressure also can be measured as an indirect measurement if there's a, any LP indication. So uh, not in every LP cases, they don't, the doctors do not perform the LP pressure. They do not uh, get the readings of LP pressure, but once there's an LP pressure indi indication, they used to measure this LP pressure during the lumbar puncture procedure. So the, this uh, procedure was initially explained in 1890s, and uh, the normal LP pressure for a healthy individual in a lateral recombinant position, which is uh, shown in this picture, is about 6 to, uh, sorry, 6 to 25 water centimeters. So this, uh, actually this range can be varied due to different reason, reasons like age, sex, and different neurological conditions. So uh, for, a, for an example, for children, CSF pressures are actually, the values are quite higher than the adult. The normal values are, for children are very higher than the adults. And for men, it's high th uh, higher than the women as well. So with aging, uh, the CSF pressure normal values can be reduced. For, so, so like these uh, different parameters can affect the normal values of the CSF pressure. And uh, the positioning also affects the CSF pressure where the inserted position the normal pressure values are between 20 to 30 watt centimeters. So uh, if the opening pressure is higher than this 25 watt centimeters, it is considered as a high ICP pressure, and the medications are done by the doctors to uh, cure the, the complications and abnormalities uh, regarding the CSN. So there are basically three methods of measuring LP pressure, where CVP manometer, IVGSR, and comp compass lumbar puncture. So when we compare the, between the ICP and the LP pressure, uh, there's a study conducted where the brain tissue sensor that was located in the right ventricle anterior roof of the brain and a lumbar, puncher, a lumbar space transducer is uh, attached to the lower spine, as you can see in the image. So the means were similar, and the standard derivation to the difference between the pressures were uh, plus, uh, 10 plus or minus 29 millimeters, millimeters uh, water, water millimeters. So uh, when we talk about the CBP manometer, which is central venous pressure manometer, this is one of the very uh, widely used method and very old method to measure C CSF pressure. This is a picture taken by uh, taken uh, via investiga uh, investigating uh, CSF pressure measurement in Kurunagal Base Hospital. And this is the CBP manometer where it consists of three-way stopcock that, that which connect the 22G needle to the uh, needle, and, and finally the CVP manometer. When the CSF fluid enters to the needle, it uh, comes into this three-way stop curve, and it rises along with the fluid column manometer, fluid column, and once the equilibri equilibrium is reached, the doctors get the reading uh, in water centimeters, because like uh, the CSF has a very uh, similar density to the water, and the mechanism of the CVP manometer is simple and similar to U-tip that, uh, that is based on basic physics, that the, we know the H, uh, pressure equals H rho G. So the pressure range of the CVP manometer is minus, uh, between minus three to 30 water centimeters. And uh, when we talk about the advantages of this method, this is a low cost uh, device, and the availability is high because in most of, in Sri Lanka, in most of the cases, the CVP manometer is used. And there's a, like, compared to ICP monitoring, the, the, it uh, contains a lower risk of patients. So, but this uh, method have uh, some low accuracy compared to ICP monitoring uh, methods, and it's cumbersome, and it's only a single-use device. So this is an IVG set, so intravenous giving set, because like in resource-limited healthcare facilities, in poor countries, in most of the poor countries, when the CV manometer is not uh, available, these IVG sets are used to 
uh, measure CVP uh, CSF pressure as an alternative to CFP manometer. But uh, this method is actually discouraged by the healthcare professionals due to the low accuracy because like the agreement uh, according to the research run by using 100 patients, the agreement between the CVP manometer and the IVG set is 75%. So this method is not uh, encouraged to perform and it has lower cost and lower risk for infections and availability is high but it has very low accuracy and it's cumbersome and it's, uh, this set can be used only for a one patient. So this is one of the novel device, a compass lamba puncher, where, which enables a digital pressure measuring of the CSF and it mainly consists of pressure transducer, integrated pre-programmed diagnostic computer and LCD. And uh, this has a, a strong correlation between opening pressures and the closing pressures in the, uh, result of reading in the compass lamba puncher. And uh, the, uh, there was a strong relation between the uh, pressure measured by uh, CVP manometer and uh, but these uh, readings of this compass lumbar punch was quite high compared to the water column manometer. But this is very limited to certain countries because in Sri Lanka uh, still uh, the CSF pressure is measured using CVP manometer and this, uh, this device is very compact, user friendly and there's low inf uh, risk for infection but the whole device should be discarded after each patient. So even the LCD and the whole device should be like it can be used only for a pa uh, single patient. The literature regarding the mechanism of this device is very limited and uh, it has a comparatively higher cost than the CVP manometer. So as in discussion, the uh, ICP measuring uh, methods are very accurate but poses a very high risk because they should be done under I uh, aseptic conditions under in uh, ICUs. So uh, the CVP manometer is uh, like it has a low cost and availability is high, but it's a very old method and uh, it's a very cumbersome um, method for the doctors and time consuming as well. So compass lumbar puncture is novel, user friendly, and we can recommend to use a compass lumbar puncture, but the cost is quite high compared to the CVP manometer. So in conclusion, uh, compass, uh, compass lumbar puncture is considered as a uh, one of the most reliable and user-friendly method to measure CSF compared to the ICP met, uh, methods of measuring and the uh, CSF uh, methods of measuring CSF. Uh, actually, uh, what we can see is the healthcare se sector actually lacks an advanced, accurate, uh, user-friendly and compact device which can be reusable for patients to measure CSF fluid pressure where I'll be doing my final year research on devising a reusable, accurate, uh, advanced device to measure the CSF pressure digitally. So these are my, the references that my literature review. And I would like to thank Dr. Amali Dalpadadu and Dr. Krishan Dalpadadu for the extended support and the guidance. And thank you. So the floor is open for questions and suggestions. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, actually, uh, I think that Compass Lumbar Punch is the only uh, electronic device you, you, you are currently using in the yes, field. Yes. So what type of transducers they are using to measure the pressure values? Sorry, sir? What, what type of transducers they are you using? They're actually using a pressure transducer and a, yeah, pressure transducer. It's a because piece like of type one. The uh, uh, literature of the mechanism of this compass lumbar puncture was actually the limited, sir, because like they do not ac give us access to, uh, uh, what's the, uh, access to the mechanism of this uh, device. That's a very limited literature. So then, uh, since now devices are available to measure the eye pressure, ocular yeah. pressure yes, in sir. telemetry methods. Yes, so I suggest that uh, better you, you can use that, that type of device uh, with the diaphragm. So then uh, maybe uh, you can have some sort of idea. Uh, yes, sir. Like uh, for the that sensor, we cannot directly put because we used to we use 22 G uh, needle to the whole procedure, CSF procedure. So like, if you like directly uh, contact with the CSF inside of the body, we need a sensor like at the tip of the needle. So it's not practically, uh, uh, we cannot do that practically because we need so many ethicals and we have to uh, like, it's a very like, it can be, pay, uh, poses a high risk for the patient and the sensor should be like replaced 
per patient. That much of cost, I don't think that Sri Lanka can manage. Thank you very much. Uh, quite curious about like um, all these are invasive procedures, I believe. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, did you find any non-invasive procedures to, uh, so to they estimate? Are, like they are doing researches on uh, measuring the CSF pressure doing MR and CTs, but like uh, that's accuracy and that's not that's uh, like in still research levels because like there's an off like the feasibility is very low like when conduct measuring the CSF pressure accurately during the imaging of MRI and CT. Due to the low accuracy, don't you think like it gives you a potential research avenue? Sorry, uh, sir? Like be, being the current accuracies are low. Yeah. Don't you think like it gives a opportunity for you to to work on the work on the problem? Uh, yes, sir. Like I'm doing my final year research regarding this topic, right. where I'll be like uh, de uh, developing a device, uh, a compact device, uh, just like the compass lumbar puncher, but it can be used only uh, for a patient. So I'll be developing a device which can be reused for the patients. So you, you, you are more concentrating on a invasive uh, procedure? Invasive one, sir. Right, yeah. Which is where there's more accuracy. Involved. Yes, sir. During lumbar puncture, I'm, I'm developing a device uh, to measure the CSF pressure during lumbar puncture, not the ICP. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. So how do you plan to sort of uh, test it? Uh, the, the thing device? is, sir, like in my device that I'm developing, there's a plastic hard tubing uh, between the device and the uh, needle. So like the tubing is only need to be replaced, the device with the LCD and the pressure sensor that do not need to be replaced. So like the tubing should be like done using a hard plastic and the molding should be done because like the tubing should be biocompatible and safe for the patient because it directly touched the brain. Mm -hmm. So like uh, I'm not going to put the ethical because it's quite not feasible during the time frame for my uh, final year project. But I'll be developing, like, I have hope of developing it, uh, doing, putting into ethical and going for clinical trials in future as well. So to get the measurements, pressure measurements, you are sort of uh, using a separate model to get the pressure measurements uh, to, to test your device? Yes, sir. Like, yeah, to validate, validate the device, mm -hmm. I'll be using, like, it, we also, anyways, we are getting a, a pressure of water centimeters. So, mm -hmm. like, we can directly measure mm -hmm. the, we can, like, we can, Validate with the device right, apparatus. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so uh, those are the three uh, presentations uh, scheduled for this uh, session. So we had a, a very uh, interesting uh, three uh, presentations. Um, and all these students have done a, done a fantastic uh, job uh, in um, reviewing and also conducting uh, uh, projects and, and writing uh, these research papers. So uh, at the very beginning, um, the, there was a review on um, predicting uh, the freezing of gait of Parkinson's patients. And uh, Ms. Jayawadana was uh, interested in uh, early detecting it uh, using, uh, you know, uh, she was in investigating the methods that were available to, to early predict this uh, freezing of gait. And uh, we were exposed to multiple uh, methods uh, that could do that. And finally, uh, I think she mentioned that IMU based uh, sensors were, uh, she's planning to use that. And then, uh, this image processing uh, study was presented by Ms. Harsha, and uh, uh, that's on uh, detecting prostate cancer uh, using this LBP uh, method. Uh, and uh, she presented her results, uh, interesting results, uh, uh, on that study. And then finally, uh, Ms. Pereira presented the, uh, the, the review she has conducted on methods of measuring CSF pressure and uh, proposed that she'll be using this, uh, the reusable pressure measurement uh, invasive uh, method to, to measure this CSF pressure. So I think uh, overall it's a, it's a very uh, enlightening session and I uh, thank Thank all the, the, the presenters. 
uh, for presenting it and also the, the other authors who contributed to those papers. And uh, finally, uh, thank you uh, for the audience for listening and asking questions. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And that will be the end of this session. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the end of the session, which was interesting and informative. So, may I have the honor of inviting Dr. Angela De Silva, the chairperson of this session, to present the certificates to the presenters. Ms. Varsha Jaiwardana. Ms. Indu Harsha. Ms. Sithumini Pereira. Thank you, sir. Juliette Silva for chairing this session. With that, we conclude this session of the 15th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalavala Defense University. Thank you very much for your active participation. Ladies and gentlemen, may I also ask that you proceed for lunch? Please note that the technical session three will commence at 1 p.m. Have a good day.